A few weeks before the uh, 2011 federal election, I got a phone call from a Conservative Party supporter asking me if I would vote Conservative. And uh, I said no. And then the day before the election, I got a phone call telling me that my polling station was, was out here, some 20 kilometers outside of town. But you know what? I had already voted the week before, and it was just down the street here from my house. In the autumn of 2015, Canadians went to the polls. It was the nation's 42nd general election. A nation that prides itself as a democracy that engages in free and fair elections. We had a reputation as being, you know, a constitutional, uh, multicultural uh, democracy uh, engaged in the best of free and fair elections. I heard this when I was in South Africa. We looked to Canada as a model uh, when they, in the post-apartheid regime. I heard it in the Soviet Union when I was uh, there representing uh, political prisoners. Canada there too uh, would, would be looked to as a model with regard to that. And therefore, we were invited very often for election uh, monitoring. Yet one event had shaken Canadians' trust in the federal electoral process. The country's 41st general election in 2011 was undermined by a voter suppression campaign unlike any other in the nation's modern times. We had evidence that someone had attempted to thwart the constitutional right of Canadians to vote. Any attempt to deprive a Canadian of their right to vote is a crime. And think about what this is about. This is about phoning people in their homes, personating someone from Elections Canada, and saying, oh, they've changed your voting section, you're sending them to another side of town. There was widespread fraudulent calling in May 2011. February and March of 2012, it began to become far more broadly understood publicly about how widespread those calls were. The fact that it would be organized uh, in such a way, uh, it went beyond what I considered anyone would do in this country. In the run-up to the 2015 general election, the America's Barometer study, conducted in 26 countries, reported Canadians had as little trust in their elections as people did in certain Latin American countries. We call it vote suppression. Uh, that's a euphemism. At the center of the controversy was the nation's ruling party. What we're talking about here is, uh, is, is tr trying to rig the vote. The Conservative Party of Canada. If you don't take an interest in politics, politics will take an interest in you. And you will wake up one morning and you will not recognize your country. And that's especially poignant when you remember that Stephen Harper himself made that promise to us. To better grasp the political culture ushered into power five years earlier, one must first discern an iron-willed prime minister in ruthless pursuit of a majority government. It was Manning who noted that uh, Stephen Harper has, uh, he has no respect for, for, for democratic processes. Manning wrote in his book, a book called Think Big, that Harper didn't want to listen to grassroots opinion at all. Uh, Stephen Harper was a guy who felt he, he knew it all. Overnight, the PMO mutated into a state of 24-7 electioneering, as Prime Minister Stephen Harper invoked a siege mentality. 
The Harper government was the first truly right-wing government in Canadian history. With the takeover of the old Progressive Conservative Party by the Alliance Party and the merger into the Conservative Party, you had basically a right-wing takeover of the party, the reform-rooted people like Stephen Harper. Uh, these were the most ideological uh, wing of the party. And as I say, it was our first right-wing government in history. Can you imagine a government in Canada saying to someone, we want the right when you apply for a job with the federal government to ask about your past politics? We would like you to have a loyalty oath to the government. Uh, no matter how many transgressions might be involved, no matter how many times you get close to the line or, uh, or, or over the line in some instances, uh, do it. Rhetoric and brinksmanship stifled a weak opposition. Issue management, media lines and talking points, by design, frustrated an overwhelmed press corps. And it works. It is a communications war, very much so, on any issue. And if you ignore that, you'll lose. Uh, in the media, we'd never seen anything like it. It was like, um, uh, it was called his vetting system, whereby every single press release had to be approved by central command. Uh, the Prime Minister's office and the Privy Council office. There's a million people in Canada that read the newspaper, actually. This is one of the keys to Stephen Harper's power as a politician. And there's another five million that watch the news. He has come to the conclusion that substance does not matter anymore. Those million people are the swing voters. That what matters is perception and the more superficial the perception, the better it is. And if you don't win the headline war with that million to five million people who are actually even watching a bit of news. People water ski across the surface of events these days. They don't do any deep diving. Then you lose because the swing voters believe those headlines. They don't have time to be double checking and doing reality checks. There had never been a level of control like that. I mean, this went to the point where, you know, if, there, if the Parks Department was putting out a press release on the uh, mating season of the black bear, it would have to get approved from the very top. Uh, much more in keeping with a society, uh, a kind of a secret society that's come to the conclusion they have their greatest leverage at the polls when fewer people vote. They make politics unpleasant. They make young people in particular not anxious to get involved, and they do things to offend. And the net effect, which is an old Republican trick from the United States, is to suppress that vote and that interest. But this story really doesn't have to do with me at all. It has to do with what I believe was ground zero, the first place that robocalls were tested to see if they would work to allow uh, electoral fraud to take place. But whoever was playing with robocalls in Saanich Gulf Islands in 2008 was finding out a couple of important things. It could be done, and the RCMP and Elections Canada would drop the ball and never find out who did it. Along British Columbia's lower mainland coast lies the archipelago of the San Juan and Gulf Islands. These waterways and isles span the Canada-U.S. border. The tidewater riding of Saanich Gulf Islands is an idyllic community. If you're a red Tory or if you're a lefty or you're a green or you're a hardcore socialist NDP, in this riding, the one thing that you love about this place is this place. But as of 2006, the riding was the West Coast jewel in Stephen Harper's energy policy. If you're sitting back in Ottawa, this riding is this little sleepy outpost way over on the west coast that has one strategic importance to Ottawa, um, and that's getting the oil out from the, the oil sands in Alberta. None of the smaller parties, not the NDP and not the Green, would ever be government. And to, in, and to do something about climate change, you had to be government. Uh, typically, the, the, the left, the progressive vote, always splits itself in Saanich Gulf Islands. And so the Greens, the Liberals, and the NDP would split 60 to 70 percent of the vote, and the Conservatives would get in. And, and so the incumbent was a Conservative, uh, then Minister of Natural Resources Gary Lunn. 
the Liberal Party under Stéphane Dion really had the potential to do something significant about climate change. So I ran on a, on a, on a platform of sort of helping to build a coalition. And Branny was identified strongly as being green. You know, we couldn't pull it off with anybody else but her. And so her message was, do like I have done, come to that recognition, join the mainstream, vote liberal, because that's how we're going to deal with climate change, because we've got a mainstream party that will actually do something about it. You know, I was completely off the radar for most of that 18 months. They're using a broadcast mes method of trying to get their message out. They're just finding any, any microphone that they can stand in front of, any newspaper reporter, any crowd, to tell their story and hope people f it filters down to the people that they can talk to. They did some door knocking, you know, in certain areas. The micro-targeting hit in, in Sandwich Gulf Islands earlier than it hit everywhere else, and the Conservatives were the only people who could do that because of SIMS. The Constituents Information Management System, or SIMS, it's a huge collection data system put in place with, by Stephen Harper. When he became the leader, they insisted that we all take part in the SIMS program. I mean, I was standing with a friend of mine uh, back in uh, 2008 uh, in Kitchener-Waterloo when a conservative canvasser came by. And uh, I was able to stand and see the, the sheet he was filling out. And he had 30 columns across the top with probing questions of my friend. All our data we collected would be forwarded to central office. And they were trying to essentially find out 30 things about who lived behind that door at that house. You know, if you understand the makeup of SIMS, how they deal with the information, that is the purpose uh, and target people. So that's a danger in itself. When the, the NDP candidate pulled out, that was really the game changer. In the final weeks of the election, NDP candidate Julian West was politically crippled by an incident from his past, as so often happens in campaign. West withdrew his candidacy. And we just closed up shop and cleaned up, and uh, we were trying to decide what to tell people to do. And basically, we said, you're on your own on this one because we don't have a candidate. And uh, we didn't tell them who to vote for. I chose to vote for Bryony because I know her. And so what happened is it created a situation where Bryony Penn, who was a well-known writer, environmentalist, TV personality, had a genuine shot at defeating the natural uh, resources minister. The NDP, the Liberals, and the Greens can all feel confident that I'm going to be taking their interest to Ottawa. The neophyte Liberal candidate surged in the polls. And that's when everything just turned. When they saw that she had a chance of beating him, the polls were so, it was showing neck and neck. And then all of a sudden, things started getting dirty. Because they realized that the hardcore NDPs didn't have anywhere to put their vote anymore. And that, that there was a good likelihood that, that, that you know, staunch NDP voters um, that they'd been voting on, always to vote NDP, would now have to put their vote somewhere, and that they would put, they could put their vote with me. The story I, I, I tell is about one of my staff was outside the Gary Lunn office when the suit showed up. The Gary Lunn campaign was about to come under the direct command of the Conservative headquarters in Ottawa something's changing here and next thing you know like they they moved into the office they took a bunch of desks they moved everybody else out of the way and the whole tenure of the cam campaign changed like all of a sudden the you know the the the, the pushback and and the accusations started flying um, and uh, it seemed much more like pointed and uh, and orchestrated it was like you know, we were the hobbits and suddenly the orcs had invaded. I remember it. It was like a, a mood came down over this sleepy little tidewater, you know, far away from Ottawa. And Ottawa suddenly kind of just realized that there was a threat. And overnight it changed. I mean, it was phenomenal. I've circulated around in political arenas, mostly in the United States. Like my background is, was there. And, you know, they play dirty. Like, they play dirty. The opposition research is, is brutal, right? And um, my experience in Canada is it's not that way, except for one party. And here I was, 
running as an, a candidate with a dangerous idea, which was to bring together a coalition of the three parties that were looking for a more moderate, diversified approach to economy, not putting all their eggs in one basket of oil. Then we started to see these black and white lawn signs, no gas tax, just black and white black lettering on, on a white background, and all of these lawn signs were stuck up around our big billboards and posters. They came, they came to town to scare the hell out of everybody about me, about the carbon tax, and they came to confuse people. On the eve of the 40th general election, an ingenious scheme was triggered. The NDP candidate despite having dropped out of the election weeks earlier, remained on the ballot. It's about rules. And the rules are clear. If you withdraw after a certain date, your name is going to appear on the ballot. To support Julian West of the NDP. Everyday families need to know they have someone in Ottawa fighting for them. We were carpet bombed the night before. Kind of strong. Wrong on the economy. The day before the election, and it was about 5 o'clock in the afternoon, I was driving home and I started getting phone calls. Have you heard about this robocall? Thousands of robocalls target NDP supporters who cast their vote for Julian West. And I was in the campaign office and it was electrifying. I, I, I couldn't react. I, I just didn't know what to do. Now you've got to remember this is in 2008. This is in 2011. We hadn't seen this in Canada before. And, you know, people had been calling the number and finding, why are the NDP doing this? This is illegal. This is crazy. I couldn't believe it, really, that this was happening and trying to make sense out of it. There was just no time to do anything and, and, and to react. And we were just like... I didn't know what was happening. Somebody was messing with us. That's what I would put it. Again, we never anticipated that kind of activity. It was uh, almost surreal. I remember just sitting there and wandering around going, I don't get it. The intent was clear to reintroduce vote splitting on the left between the failed NDP campaign and the Liberal candidate's lead in the polls. We reached out, I know the Liberals, we reached out to the NDP and said, were you guys behind this? I mean, it could have been calls that were pre-programmed, that somehow someone released. The automated call supposedly originated from the home of Bill Graham, president of the NDP Riding Association. <laughs> there was a knock on the door and reporters and, and uh, pe with people with cameras descended in, uh, came into the house and, and um, said, do you know what had just happened? And uh, I said, no, actually I didn't. They investigated. Nobody in their campaign office was behind it. They checked with national headquarters. No, they said nobody was behind it. Uh, and they were upset about it. Somebody was impersonating his number. Well, I was outraged. I was outraged. Obviously, you know, the first thing I did when I uh, uh, was to call the RCMP. We just contacted the police and said, this has happened. It's not true. It's not right. And the, our, the uh, president of the Riding Association did not send out a message that came from somewhere else. The RCMP said, well, um, that wasn't really their business. And I said, of course it's your business. This is a case of fraud. They fraudulently used my name. And um, they said, well, go and visit your local police. So I went to the Saanich police and made a report to them. Dismal. Dismal. Now, the police would say, sort of say nice things, but they didn't seem to be able to do anything or they were polite. I then called immediately Elections Canada as well. And Elections Canada, um, and I wrote to Elections Canada at the same time. I sent them an, an email and they emailed me back um, saying um, there was really nothing they could do. 
The citizens of the islands collected substantial evidence as part of a petition for Elections Canada to launch a full investigation. We documented everything with evidence and submitted it to Elections Canada. Other people were doing it. The NDP were doing it. Um, they went to the RCMP. People were documenting it with evidence. And then nothing happened. So I got in touch with Democracy Watch. Well, the first thing I thought of was, what is this robocall? I've never heard of this being used in an election campaign. And then I thought, um, OK, clearly there must be a record because this was booked with the telecommunications company and they must know who booked it and they must know it went through their wires to everyone's phone so there must be a trail and they can just trace it back find the person and and that person will be prosecuted uh, and I was very surprised to see that not happen. In time it was discovered the automated fraudulent calls originated from the United States. Then Will Horder wrote this blog, which I think is, should go down in history, because it said, look out Canada, you don't know what's coming. You should be paying attention to what's going on in Saanich and the Gulf Islands. In, in my blog, Carl Rove Comes to Canada, I said, look at all you gotta do, what they've, what they've just laid out the recipe for how to rig an election. All you gotta do is hire a US calling firm to call massively into Canada. And not only does Election Canada not have the rigor to actually go after that, they don't actually have the staff should mandate to actually subpoena that kind of information. But also ignores the uh, section of the Act uh, that says that foreigners are not allowed to be intervening in Canadian elections. Elections Canada declined to investigate on either side of the U.S.-Canada border. The agency cited a lack of evidence. And so to have the Commissioner of Canada Elections roll over like that sent a signal, I think, very clearly that, that this is fine. Go ahead and do this. Just do it offshore from a foreign country and the Commissioner will just roll over and, and say, sorry, I can't do anything about it. Wow. Why the silence? Why is nobody following up on this? If Elections Canada and the RCMP had given themselves to really finding out what happened, instead of taking it like, oh, it was a nuisance. It was a game. People were making calls. It was a crime. People cheated. The following evening, election day, Briani Penn watched poll returns with campaign staff and supporters. One minute I was sitting there and, you know, the media were all there hoping that, you know, this was going to be a big media event and unseating of a minister. And I really thought that we were going to pull it off. The polls came in and they said, you know, no. Nope. This little margin that wasn't happening and, 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 and the vote wasn't coming out in the same way that we had anticipated and it just wasn't happening and the conservative vote was all there. Everybody told me I was going to win. That was what was really interesting. Up until the, the robocall, we were so confused. All the polls said that I was going to win. You know, there was enough votes bled off to the NDP that if those votes hadn't bl bled off to the NDP, the margin of victory was narrow enough that it could have changed the result. Literally, the lights went out on the cameras. Everybody went home. The reality is that we're different from most people. We're different because we're consumed with and focus on and live politics and pay attention all the time. But the average person who's got a family and kids and stuff like that, only pays attention peripherally. I got on the bus, I took the last bus, and I got on the last ferry. So they may have heard that the NDP candidate was off the ballot. They may not have. And I came home to my, it was pouring with rain. It was, my house was damp and cold. I'd hardly seen it over the last, you know, 40 days. And some of those people may have gone in and voted NDP anyway, but certainly by getting a phone call on the last day, it would have reminded them and it would have made them go out and vote NDP. And uh, I felt like Cinderella after the ball. And, and in fact, someone had actually left a big pumpkin on my doorstep to say thank you. Uh, I, I think a lot of us were in shock. Um, I, 
you yeah and then you you get angry once you, and uh, you get disappointed for Kit Spence it went beyond winning or losing and, and and I guess at the time I didn't really think it through I didn't think that this was going to be a pattern but then the next general election comes along and then we start to see a pattern in this kind of stuff and what we're seeing and this is what really aggravates me is is that we're seeing a pattern in governance and in election campaigning from the Conservative Party, which is in contempt of Parliament, in contempt of the election laws, and in contempt of the fundamental principle of rule of law. Well, I thought it was a very important event. Uh, everybody was expecting that the Conservatives would be defeated on their budget. And lo and behold, the motion concerning contempt of Parliament was in fact adopted, and that's what precipitated the election. In the early spring of 2011, a political tempest raged on Parliament Hill. For the first time in the country's history, a prime minister was found in contempt of parliament. This goes back to what we said earlier about the man's manic drive for control over everything. Well, he wouldn't surrender basic costing of programs, information on the costing of programs, to parliament. The Harper government fell for refusing to produce vital documentation opposition members needed to assess the passing of legislation. First in history, contempt, that's a pretty strong word. What came as a surprise to me is that it was talked about a bit in the first few days of the campaign and then completely forgotten about it. I was disappointed with the role that we played in how that story uh, was presented to the public. And let me be particular about why. I was there when Stephen Harper walked out the first prime minister in the whole Commonwealth to be found in contempt of parliament. And when he finally did meet the press that day, he never even mentioned it. For Stephen Harper, the stakes were high. Anything less than a clear majority would be construed as a personal failure. Despite the Prime Minister's contentious relationship with the press, 27 of the country's 34 major newspapers endorsed a Harper majority. A lot of times, the campaigns don't matter. The, the results are pretty well set in concrete before the campaigns, the debates don't matter. In the final days of the election, the Conservative Party of Canada continued to poll towards a third consecutive minority government. This is one of those cases where it didn't look anything like the going in results. The final results were very different. A whole bunch of incredibly unexpected things happened in 2011 election. At the 11th hour, the Conservative Party of Canada emerged from its fourth general election in less than seven years with a majority. The day belonged to Stephen Harper. The Harper Conservatives had taken 39.6% of the popular vote, a 166-seat majority of the then 308 seats in the House. The Liberal Party of Canada was decisively humbled. The Bloc Québécois lost official party status to the breathtaking rise of Jack Layton's new Democratic Party in Quebec. Well, I mean, when you believe in something, and Jack was an incredible salesman, and he was able to get people on side, and he believed so strongly in a fairer Canada and a better Canada, and a Canada where we were removing inequalities instead of, instead of adding inequality, as we have been for decades now. It was a pretty compelling vision, but it worked. By summer's end, the charismatic leader was gone. A lot of people will say in hindsight, oh, I saw that coming. Nobody had saw this. I remember, for example, when at one point, 
we predicted that the NDP were going to win 100 seats. I remember Andrew Coyne going, Frank Graves is on crack cocaine. Well, you know, as it turns out, not, uh, that was not true. And uh, we actually were spot on. They won 101 seats. On the following day, Frank Graves posted an analysis apology on his company website. We believe that we have overall as good and probably better record at forecasting the outcome of uh, federal elections than anyone else in the country. There's some others that have done well, but I don't think anyone's done as well or better than us. For example, in 2006, we had the exact outcome right down to within one seat of what the Conservatives won. In 2008, we were the closest. We were within one point of the final result of the Conservative victory, called it uh, quite clearly. So these things are very important, and we treat them quite seriously. And we had no reason to believe going into 2011 that we would do any more poorly than we had in the past. We'd never miss calling not only who was going to win, but whether they were majority and minority, and typically much closer than that. On that May 2nd, 2011, Election Day, a young Toronto entrepreneur monitored his client's electoral campaigns and the day's news coverage in real time. I was monitoring all of the voter contact that was uh, being done for the NDP uh, using equipment that I'd designed. Simon Rowland develops technologies that are a mainstay in electoral campaigns. I saw in the news on my on, on my computer the the report of the of uh, people being told to go vote in the wrong place all day long on election day, all day long on election day we heard it was happening in Saanich Gulf Islands, and we began to get reports because I'm party leader. The team in Ottawa and across the country, other candidates were calling in and saying there's something very wrong here. If you asked a hundred people on the street in 2011 what a robocall was, they would not know. We're getting a lot of voters complaining that they're being called and being told to change polling stations. And we, be and we became very concerned about it. They would not know that, for example, a person could reach phone 200,000 people in 20 minutes and give an automated voice message that may or may not be true. Yeah, I mean, there were reports of fraudulent calls that follow a few different patterns all across the country. I think the Elections Canada officials were astonished. But in the United States, this uh, has been a fact of political life for many years. They began on April 29th to receive complaints from just a couple of ridings. Uh, shortly afterward, they were receiving complaints from 11 ridings. And uh, by election day, it was uh, a tidal wave. They were getting complaints from right across the country. And we became very concerned about it. So concerned that when the election was over, I wrote Elections Canada and said, not only in my own writing, but across Canada, I've heard of hundreds of examples of voters who were told to go to a polling station and, and with calls pretending to be from Elections Canada. Rowland recognized signature technologies employed in clandestine fashion to undermine the vote. When I saw that, I immediately knew uh, what kind of fraud uh, it was. One news report in particular caught Rowland's attention. The riding of Guelph lies in the heart of central Ontario, an hour's drive west of Toronto. In Guelph, they, they basically phoned every single identified opposition supporter. Hello? This is an automated message from Elections Canada. At 10.03 a.m. on that May 2nd, thousands of automated calls inundated Guelph, claiming to be from Elections Canada, calls that informed voters their polling stations had changed. Uh, organized chaos, if you know what I mean. There was a, a heightened sense of urgency, which I didn't understand until I got in and was told that we were getting call after call after call from people who had been told to go and vote elsewhere. And so came home uh, and I found a message on the answering machine, which said it was a message from Elections Canada telling us that our polling station had changed and um, 
I was really confused because, of course, we had just voted. Hundreds of electors were misdirected to the Quebec Street Mall. I was very uh, empathetic to the people who were at the polling station because clearly they had received several people who had come and they had to, they had to let me and the other people in my position know that we had foolishly believed what we shouldn't have. Elderly people, uh, young mothers with children, there, there were voters who were reported to have torn up their voter information cards and, and stomped off in fury. And then I realized the impact of that, that this handful of people around me who couldn't go to their, their real polling station, that their votes were lost. I thought, this can't be voter suppression, not in Canada. <laughs> And as things began to unravel and, and we begin, began to find out what was happening, I, I became really angry. And it was the local returning officer that called the radio station and alerted the radio station and the radio station started putting out messaging to ignore the call. And it was in a captive media market. So, so it was in an area where people listened to local news as opposed to listening to news from, uh, from another centre. And so we thought, you know, we need to accumulate as much information as we possibly can. People's recollection of the call, a recording if they had one, um, what number might have appeared on the call display, what was said, of course, their, uh, their coordinates, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. That day, before the polls even closed, Roland emailed Elections Canada with detailed technical insight on what would become known as the robocall scandal. Uh, so, I, so I was thinking, how could you trace these calls back? And I, I worked out a strategy and I communicated that to Elections Canada on election day. Hey, you know, remember those stories we heard of during the campaign about these weird phone calls people were getting? And, and I mean, they were just, I remember like he hearing the stories maybe on the radio and reading them in, in some of the newspapers. Stephen Marr and Glenn McGregor then post-media journalists, had covered the 41st general election and were assigned to Parliament Hill. And they were kind of scattered stories, you know, and, and it was just in that, that little interregnum period, that week after the election campaign, or week after the, the election day, when we were starting to hear these stories, right? Who would do that? Uh, they would need money, they would need uh, you know, a phone bank, likely professional people, volunteers aren't going to want to do that kind of thing. And then they kind of went away because the tsunami of the narrative of the Harper majority government. It takes time for the message to get out, but in the new propaganda politics we live under, um, the press often is too busy recycling the narratives and scenarios of the political parties to do its basic work. And let's face it, we missed the boat big time. Um, so Steve and I, once we decided to start working on the story about this, we, the first thing we did was we assembled this uh, list of all the writings in which there had been media reports of these kinds of phone calls, either robocalls or live calls. I thought that someone had likely hired uh, a phone bank to make deceptive telephone calls. Hey, in your writing, did you hear anything, in, you know, in Eglinton Lawrence, did you hear anything about phone calls? And we hear, well, matter of fact, we did. This is what happened. This is what we experienced. If what was going on in Toronto um, was going on across the country, that could have been the answer to what happened. So we put together a database, and we're calling people uh, across the country. Candidates, campaign managers, volunteers, voters, uh, what happened in the Toronto riding, the very first riding where it became a story, the calls, the robocalls, were coming from North Dakota. Some of the calls may have come from North Dakota because that number shows up on somebody's call display. It uh, was very, very frightening because it meant someone from outside Canada was having a possibly big and maybe even decisive influence on a federal election. Calling phone banks in Minnesota and North Dakota and... Uh, Florida. Everybody has a little bit of information in each riding, right? They know something's happened in their riding, they don't know where it came from. Trying to find 
the phone banks that might have done those kind of things. But when you consider the very few votes that made the difference, it was only a matter of 6,500 or so votes that made the difference between winning and losing the majority. Um, to me, it, it gives great importance to robocalls. Incrementally, we're getting more and more stories. And, and what we're thinking is, hey, we've got a, 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 you know, a, a series of feature stories about the topic of vote suppression in general, and, and a, a pattern, but no smoking gun. Because robocalls worked on small margins. We never really uh, got to the bottom of the whole thing. And one of them was going to be about telephone calls. Another one was going to be about intimidation at ballot box or at polling locations. It was all kind of B plus. Like we thought it was good, but it wasn't. We know we didn't have great stuff. We thought it would have been okay, and we would have done it, and you know, and then it would have gone away, right? And I was kind of resigned to that. I didn't think we were going to get anywhere. And Steve really, really pushed it. Like he said, no, we got to keep working the phones. We got to get somewhere. I'm thinking. I actually was looking for. I don't think I even told him this, but I was looking for ways to get out of the whole project at one point. So there was anger in the community, but I remember w there's a gentleman who does a lot of walking in my neighborhood, and I would um, see him often in the morning as I walked into work. Um, very angry about it, but was convinced nothing would happen about it. He was convinced that it would get covered up, um, that the people that um, were that had committed this would 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 not be brought to task for it. Right. I mean, this just shows you how little we know as journalists about what's really happening. Quite often, you know, the, the Elections Canada apparently was at that point. I mean, just days after the election, their investigator Alan Matthews was there. Uh, in a Holiday Inn in Guelph, uh, interviewing people who had, had, who had received these telephone calls. Alan Matthews is a retired RCMP officer and a veteran of electoral fraud investigations, most of which involved white-collar crimes. Uh, but we contacted Elections Canada immediately after and asked them to start to investigate. Elections Canada, for all I know, they had good legal sound reasons not to investigate 2008 Sandwich Gulf Islands. We had created quite a file of complaints. I think there were over 80, and, and we didn't even get them all because there were so many people calling in. But what we see in, in 2011 is how quick uh, Al Matthews was to react. He was up there within days of the election, interviewing people, methodically building, trying to find the pattern, contacting, sitting down, interviewing the people who got the calls. He traveled to Guelph and he interviewed me and took a, a statement and um, I asked him the same question, how long will this take? He said, well, you know, we're going to do our due diligence here, we're going to investigate it. And, and then eventually he gets to a point, I think, where he's ordering phone records and he recognizes that he doesn't have the technical skill, he doesn't know enough about the way the telephone communications work and so on. And at that point he goes outside and basically someone volunteers to help him with information. He admitted that he was from a, uh, something of a typewriter generation, so I was able to help sort of give a framework for how, how this crime would have, would have taken place. Matthews holds only one piece of evidence an ID phone number left on the call displays of Guelph robocall recipients. I, I was able to tell that the phone number that was on the call display was a burner phone by looking it up through, uh, looking up uh, where the carriers route traffic to that phone number. Mr. Matthews, who's more of a typewriter guy than a cutting edge electronic crime investigator, you know, this is why it's so important to have uh, technical expertise available uh, on, in such a nerdy investigation like this is because you go to the phone company and you ask them for records and the first person you speak to, they won't even know what types of equipment the phone company's got in their data center, let alone where the records are or how to, how to instruct their, their network operations group to retrieve them. And so they'll just say, well, we can't, we can't do it. So you have to, you, you got to keep digging and drilling. There's a question, I guess you could say, should Elections Canada not have the kind of capability in-house that CRTC does, for example? So as part of the subpoenas that I was working out with Al Matthews, uh, we, we got the calling records from this cell phone. Matthews issued a subpoena to retrieve the burner phone's outgoing calls. 
I mean, Al Matthews came to my office with this two inch thick stack of phoning records that had come from these subpoenas that we designed together. Mr. Matthews uh, pursues this and he pursues lead after lead. So on the calling records, we had all these inbound calls from people phoning back, you know, when they received the fraud calls. But then, but then there was also this call to an 800 number. And I learned this after the fact that Elections Canada has only so much resources available to them to investigate. I saw that and I immediately knew that that would be them phoning into the recording line to set up the message. So when I called that, when I called that number, it said, you know, welcome to RAC, you know, basically welcome to two call. I looked that up and it was RAC 9, a conservative only call center in Alberta. Uh, I know that Al did everything that, uh, that he could um, on his own uh, and given, I think, the limited resources that he had. I wish that Elections Canada had more resources. And at that point, I, I knew that, uh, like, the whole rest of the case was clear to me at that moment. For months, Simon Rowland had one mission, aiding Election Canada's investigation into the Guelph scandal. Rowland's obsessive determination sparked Elections Canada investigations in 18 more ridings. Included was the Marty Burke Conservative campaign in Guelph. So this is happening, and it just the information just isn't getting out to people. It's just it's Elections Canada is very secretive. They they're they're very cautious and they proceed very slowly, and they don't like a lot of attention, right? Yet Roland found himself at a crossroads. Uh, I I thought it was in the public interest to be aware that this type of you know mass scale election fraud had taken place uh, with a sitting government. Roland decides to leak the story to the press. Uh, Steve got a, a, a tip that Elections Canada was actively investigating in Guelph and that there was a guy we should talk to who knew something about it. The story being, Elections Canada was acting on solid evidence that a local conservative campaign had unleashed thousands of illicit calls targeting non-conservative supporters. A lot of back and forth, Steve eventually gets a hold of the guy and he's got great information. He knows what's going on. He's, he knows about the investigation, he knows who's leading it. When I came into contact with Maren McGregor, I could see how much work they'd put into the story. And he's also told that this guy knows the investigation is focused on this company in Edmonton called RAC9. And I was able to give them something that would make it so they could print this. We're a day away from publishing our story, but we've got to go to Rack 9 and get their version of events, figure out what's happening. We also think this is a good opportunity for us to, to extract some information from Rack 9 about what, what actually happened, right? So these are really important phone calls. Rack 9, owned and operated by Matt Meyer, provides a voice broadcast system for automated telephone solicitations. During the 2011 general election, Rack 9's exclusive client, was the Conservative Party of Canada. And Meyer pretty much lays out the whole story from his point of view. Uh, he tells us that yes, Elections Canada had come to his office out in Edmonton with a production order, court order, that he was cooperating with them. He didn't know that his company had been used to make these illegal robocalls. So I design telephone equipment for nonprofits to use to advance their mission. So. I've spent a lot of time doing that. But I know all of my customers, and you've got to train them to use the equipment. Meyer made, a, made a, a, a pretty compelling case that he, his company didn't know about this at the time, that they were somehow being, being used as well and being deceived as well because they didn't know their, their service was being co-opted to make what was obviously an, committed, uh, an illegal act. It, it always struck me as a little strange that somebody could use uh, it could could use uh, call center technology like this without knowing who their customer is. We've got now documentary evidence that the conservative campaign in Guelph was in contact on election day with the company that our source is telling us was that is being investigated by Elections Canada. And that's when we knew we had the story. I, I thought that you know under the principle of open principle of the courts being open, it must be possible to get a hold of the affidavit, the ITO. Roland decides to locate a crucial body of evidence which he himself was instrumental in assembling, the RAC-9 production order. 
Matthews had filed that production order with Alberta Provincial Court for Rack 9 Records. And he needed to know the date that it was served on and the address that it was served on. And I was able to give them both of those facts. McGregor, with information supplied by Roland, requests an Edmonton courthouse reporter to locate Matthew's ITO in Alberta's provincial court. McGregor receives word from the Edmonton reporter the ITO is to be faxed. Fax? Okay, I, I don't know the last time I received a fax. I don't think I'd received a fax in a year at that point. It's, nobody does fax, everybody's email. But anyway, okay, so he's going to fax it to the courthouse. So Stephen and I, and so he sends us a note saying, faxing now. So Steve and I go stand around, stand right next to the fax machine, kind of hovering over it as we're hearing question period going on and questions about robocalls. That same production order outlined a body of evidence that justified the entire Elections Canada investigation. And we start to read Al Matthews' narrative of the investigation at this point. So whoever was responsible for the illegal robocalls had gotten like a burner phone. And of course, Steve and I turned to each other and said, hey, it's just like The Wire. Right, you know, guys going around, these drug kingpins with these disposable cell phones, swapping SIM cards or whatever they do. So I thought, oh, that's good. The disposable cell phone, or burner phone, was registered to a Joliet, Quebec phone number. And then there's this moment where, and I think maybe this is something that happens like once or twice in a career, where kind of the, the clouds part and you have this wonderful gift handed to you as a journalist. And we look down and read, the name of who the cell phone is registered to, and it's Pierre Poutine of Separatist Street in Joliet, Quebec. Well, the name Pierre Poutine uh, came up once we subpoenaed records from, uh, from Bell, which the burner phone ultimately was, came from. That was the name that was given to, given to Bell when the account for that burner phone was first being set up. Obviously a bogus name, but whoever's committed this crime has chosen the name of this <laughs> inherently Canadian junk food as the nom de plume or nom de guerre of, for this, you know, probably criminal act that he's committing. Pierre Poutin had opened an account using prepaid credit cards, Rack 9. So we've moved at this point from having these kind of vague narratives about these vague descriptions about telephone calls that people receive that they don't know where they came from. Some of the calls came during the night. We don't know if they were just badly planned or badly executed phone calls made on behalf of a legitimate campaign or if there's something more to it. But in the case of Guelph now, we had pretty clear evidence of an attempt to, you know, suppress votes. We had, we had pretty clear evidence of fraud. Pierre Poutin logged on to Rack 9s web interface and uploaded a call list of Guelph telephone numbers. Uh, the main thing is that you needed to have access to a list of opposition supporters. So only uh, like one of the political parties that in the course of their operations talks to every voter and asks, are you going to vote for us or not? So, I mean, you need to have access to that kind of data to be able to, you know, you need to have the phone number. The bogus Elections Canada message was phoned in using Rack 9s 1-800 number. At the appointed time, the service auto-called the provided phone numbers, delivering the message. So this, was, this was a crime. There's no question about it. This was a call pretending to be from Elections Canada. Elections Canada doesn't call people. Uh, it, was, it was giving people, voters in Guelph, uh, intentionally incorrect information. In less than 15 minutes, over 7,600 Guelph voters were contacted. You cannot get a worse violation of the democratic system than, than that, than interfering with the people's right to vote. Marr and McGregor's story about a voter suppression campaign in Guelph, Ontario by way of bogus Election Canada robocalls vindicates suspicions of a widespread voter suppression scheme sparked a national furor. Prime Minister Stephen Harper denounces the allegations as a smear campaign. This is the first time in Canada that in a major way a tactic pioneered in the United States by Republican Party operatives has really made waves here. 
Within days, Elections Canada receives 31,000 messages from Canadians related to the robocall scandal. Over 200 ridings report live and automated calls that misdirected voters. What you're asking me is, Jean-Pierre, could you imagine that somebody would break the law in this way? And my answer is no. Canadians take to the streets, protesting the Harper government's inaction. When you're running elections, you know that people, some people will try something, but you don't imagine that a massive effort like this will be attempted against the Canadian public. You just don't. An Ipsos Reid poll reports 68% of Canadians demand by-elections in affected ridings. 75% of Canadians call for an independent judicial inquiry. By midsummer, 40,000 Canadians sign petitions demanding an independent public inquiry. Eight Canadian voters from across the country filed applications in federal court on the grounds that a voter suppression campaign of misleading calls benefited the Conservative wins. The Council of Canadians uh, called me and uh, Stephen Schreiben's office called to see if I would consider joining a court case on uh, the robocalls. Well, the actual fact of the matter was that I felt that somebody was trying to mess with my vote. So I gave it some thought and I thought about my dad who uh, lost his leg in World War II. There's a group of people came together and said, we're going to try to trick Canadians out of their vote. Rooms full of them. And I thought he uh, did that to defend democracy. Yeah, well, it's, it's appalling. Uh, it's shocking, really. I, I, it makes me think I'm quite naive, really. My lifetime, I haven't been called on to do that. But in this uh, situation, it seemed like I was being called on. Was trying to keep me from voting by giving me false information. I don't know where they come from. I don't, I don't want them in my community. And that upset me. Uh, I had a chance to be part of righting a clear wrong. It, I didn't hesitate. Comparison to the sacrifice that the World War II vets made, um, I thought this is the least that I can do. Voter suppression was about to be placed on trial. I would like to remind you and everybody else, the chief electoral officer does not lay charges. The chief electoral officer does not carry out investigations. The chief electoral officer does not prosecute. He does not find guilt. This is so important. If, and this has been misunderstood by a lot of people in the political sphere, in the political game. It was the one judicial hearing the litigious Harper Conservatives feared most. The media coverage and public interest was such that the trial was moved to the Supreme Court of Canada buildings. The court challenge, financed by the Council of Canadians, was represented by public interest litigator Stephen Schreibman. Uh, the chief electoral officer can't annul the result of the election and can't apply to the court for that remedy either. Only an elector can do that under the law now. So only a judge has the right to annul the result of the election, and that jurisdiction can only be exercised upon the application of an elector or a candidate. Schreibman petitions the Elections Canada investigation for evidence regarding misleading calls, both live and automated. Pollster Frank Graves was entrusted to enter evidence in the federal court cases. Graves was to survey a cross-section of Canadian voters to quantify the impact of misleading calls in the applicants' writings. Graves was skeptical. I told my client from the outset, look, I have no idea whether I'm going to find anything here or not, but I'm going to design this in a fashion that the tests are what we call critically falsifiable. The standards for whether we accept or reject the hypothesis are established in advance. We'll collect the data, we'll see what happens, and we'll draw the conclusions accordingly. On the second day of the six-day trial, Schreidman, with evidence in hand, stood before federal court justice Richard Mosley, 
Schreibman cited the Elections Canada evidence that a voter suppression campaign went far beyond Guelph, Ontario. A pattern had evolved not only on Election Day, but in the days and weeks leading up to May 2, 2011. The veteran litigators' submissions to federal court traced a nationwide covert operation of voter suppression. It happened in the conservative riding of Egmont, Prince Edward Island, where live calls, said to be from the Liberal Party, harassed their own supporters for weeks. In Kingston, Ontario, on Election Day, voters arrived at St. Joseph's Catholic Church only to be informed by a rehearsing organist the church was not a polling station. It happened in North Bay, where angry voters flooded Liberal incumbent Anthony Rhoda's campaign headquarters with complaints of misleading calls. We called Elections Canada to find out why they were changing the location at this late, this late time. They claimed they weren't doing it. And what we did is, the calls that came in, we continued to tell them that, no, in fact, go to the poll that you're at, disregard the phone call, we don't know where it's coming from. Election Canada has told us to stay with your original poll. Rhoda would lose his seat by 28 votes. In Winnipeg, South Central, live calls sent voters to a polling station some 25 kilometers west to this church. In Saskatoon, a senior's residence was targeted. But the polling station was not dozens of kilometers away, as the fraudulent calls stated, but in the building's lobby. In Thunder Bay, Annette Degagné, a call center worker for RMG Responsive Marketing Group, a company exclusively contracted to the Conservative Party, admits she made misleading calls. In the last days of the election, Degagné and her co-workers were instructed to tell people Elections Canada had changed their polling locations. In a sworn affidavit, Degagné states, I recall one woman in Winnipeg telling me that the address I just gave her was over an hour away. When Degagné and her co-workers voiced concern to RMG supervisors, they were told to stick to the script. My takeaway from this is that um, you can do this and you can do it again. You can do this voter suppression stuff again. I think what's, what's interesting is how sophisticated the um, technology is now in terms of being able to target uh, the people you want to influence. And so it's not as if you now target even a riding. Um, you can target a demographic in a pool. And so you might know that Jews in this poll vote this way in a riding that's close. If you can discourage so many of them from getting to the poll, um, you can win the riding. How do you discourage them? If it happens to be Rosh Hashanah, you phone them at 6.30 on Friday evening and you pretend to be a liberal. The voter suppression professionals launched a faith-based attack on the Winnipeg South Central Jewish community. At the time, the riding's liberal incumbent was Anita Neville. There were certainly the calls that went in to members of the Jewish community late at night or during Passover seders, call, saying that they were calling from the Liberal Party, 10.30 at night, 11 o'clock at night. Those calls were made. We weren't making those calls at all. Anita Neville lost her seat by 696 votes. Faith-based voter suppression was rampant in the Montreal riding of Mont Royal. Incumbent Professor Erwin Kotler faced complaints from Jewish constituents. We didn't call. Uh, somebody was impersonating themselves as if they were calling from the Liberal uh, Party. A, a clear attempt uh, to uh, <coughs> misrepresent themselves as uh, liberals, but to prejudicially uh, confuse uh, the voter, again, all these matters that have no place in an election campaign, a form of voter suppression. They were also irate the voters uh, on another matter that we were allegedly giving them false information as to where their polling uh, was, and we hadn't given out that false information at all. No matter where in the country, if a voter was within reach of a telephone, 
and was a non-conservative supporter, the bogus calls found the voter, even on the Alaska Highway. I kind of, it wasn't hard to put it together because I had told, they were the only ones that had called me and I said, no, I wasn't supporting them. And maybe because I had said never in a million years or something like that, I felt possibly that I was targeted then to go to the wrong polling station. I Somehow I connected that first call to this call. Frank Grave exposed a trend line, a correlation between the fraudulent calls and voter identification or profiling. Voters identified as non-conservative supporters were three and four times more likely to receive harassing or misleading calls late in the campaign. In fact, we also found that people who told us I had been called earlier by the Conservative Party and they'd asked me what my support was and if they said I wasn't Conservative, they were two or three more times as likely to get this subsequent call saying, oh, by the way, your polling station's moved to somewhere that it might not really be. Schreibman reminds the court that on May 2, 2011, an overwhelmed Elections Canada warned the public not to trust calls claiming polling stations had been relocated. On May 23, 2013, Federal Court Justice Richard Mosley handed down his decision. The election results in the ridings applicants contested would not be overturned. But Justice Mosley did conclude that widespread fraud had occurred in the 41st general election. And we have a finding from the Federal Court that there was an organized effort to suppress the vote of Canadian electors across Canada. Justice Mosley deemed the most likely source used to make the misleading calls was the SIMS database, maintained and controlled by the Conservative Party. But no evidence exists that the use of the database was approved or condoned by the party. The federal court decision is a very powerful decision. It's extremely powerful. And I think every Canadian should read that decision because Justice Mosley concluded that there was a widespread campaign of fraudulent calling in the May 2011 federal election, that it was targeted at non-supporters of the Conservative Party of Canada, that it was effective in reducing voter turnout, and that the most likely source of the data used to make those calls is the SIMS database of the Conservative Party of Canada. Justice Richard Mosley's decision in May of 2013 would become the most underreported story in the country. Steve Schreibman and the Council of Canadians, full, full credit for bringing those cases forward. Because if not for that decision from the Ontario court, Mr. Justice Mosley, we would not have any independent interlocutor who's looked at this, who could say, which he did as a matter of court record, there was a massive attempt at election fraud in 2011. He said, we don't know who did it, and we're not able to tell on the evidence we have here whether it affected the outcome in these ridings. You know, we live in a democratic society, and, and, and that needs to be defended. And whether the assault comes by way of a free trade agreement that disempowers governments from regulating in the public interest, or in this particular case, an effort by someone to actually undermine the democratic electoral process, um, those are fights that um, I'm happy to be engaged in. Of the countless fraudulent calls that deceived voters nationwide during the 41st general election, of the 247 ridings that filed complaints with Elections Canada regarding misleading calls and the dozens of investigations launched by the agency, only one criminal conviction was handed down in a court of law. On November 19, 2014, former Conservative staffer and communications director to the Marty Burke Conservative campaign, Michael Sona, 
was convicted of aiding and abetting person or persons in the Guelph robocall scandal. Sona, 26 years of age at the time, was sentenced to nine months in jail, plus a year on probation for attempting to mislead voters from casting a ballot. I think that the advantage of the conviction in the Sona case, in the robocalls case, is it finally drew people's attention to the fact that it was true. I found it all kind of disconcerting. And that you have this young man who was 22 at the time of the events, who's convicted of essentially aiding and abetting in election fraud. And this is closing the books on the Guelph robocall case. I think that Elections Canada massively bungled up the investigation. And at the end of the day, when they could have acquired evidence, they let it lapse. They trusted people they shouldn't have trusted. But we know that he didn't act alone, and the judge made that clear. I, <laughs> I find it always extraordinary whenever I hear people say, you know, we want him to name names and, you know, we're not going to believe him until he does. It tells me that some people are more comfortable believing a lie than the truth. And maybe more than one other person uh, watched this whole trial. And in spite of the fact that they were culpable to some extent, were prepared to let the kid take the fall for this. If, let's say, I had the ability to name names, all right, I would have done it a long time ago. Trust me, I don't owe these people anything, okay? They threw me under the bus. I went to jail. And he said to me, my big mistake was trusting them too much. I trusted the party too much. We know that other people were involved in that but not apprehended. We know that Michael Sona has not spoken about that, has not testified, he hasn't said anything. If I had ever wanted to just end this all right away, you know what the easiest way would have been? For me to come out and name names, or to say, it was just me, right? One of those two possibilities, and that would have ended everything. And it would have also made things easier on me. As a person, he, ha he has some good qualities, and he's impressive, and so is the evidence against him. I would say that the basic point I'd make about Michael Sona is when I asked the question of him, did you do this? He looked me straight in the eye and he said, no, I did not do this. I asked him if he knew who did it, and he said, no, I don't. I can make an educated guess from media reports that I've read, and uh, that's where his story came, his story came to rest. So the most crucial piece of evidence in the whole Guelph investigation is who downloaded the list from Sims that matches the list that was loaded into the Rack 9 system that was used to send out these calls. And the, the bizarre thing is that when, uh, so when Elections Canada subpoenas the Conservative Party to, set, to, to ask for this information, uh, those records are missing from the database. It's still a mystery. It's still, uh, you, ha you have a sense that uh, we don't know what happened in this really unusual political crime. You know, pushing onwards from like, why are these records missing, to give us the backup tapes, give us your command line access logs, which I urged Elections Canada to pursue. Uh, you know, I, I, w I wish that we'd I wish that we'd uh, been able to, to get every, every bit of information that would, uh, that would shed light onto the case. Well, I think if you do anything more than just happen to read a headline that came after the verdict, you probably know that they didn't get the person. Um, you look at every single piece of information that came out, the fact that I wasn't even in the country when these witnesses claimed that I confessed to them here in Ottawa. You know, and this is the, the interesting part. This case was examined by the RCMP, Elections Canada, the CRTC, I mean, Conservative Party headquarters too, if you want to use that example. This was a case that was just gone over like crazy. This whole way through, through the investigation, you know, by the press and Elections Canada, 
through the trial, through the initial imprisonment, the appeal, second time in jail, you know, the two times in front of the parole board, every single step of the way I've said, look, I didn't do it, and I have no knowledge of who did. It's not like I'm going before these, these groups and saying, oh, maybe these guys will take pity on me if I say I didn't do it. I know they're going to be harder on me. I know that, but I still say it because it's the truth. To this day, Michael Zona maintains his innocence. In April of 2014, on the heels of the Fair Elections Act debacle, the Commissioner of Elections Canada, Eve Cote, released the much-anticipated summary investigation report on robocalls. Elections Canada terminated its investigation, citing a lack of evidence. It tell, that tells me that the commissioner's report is a whitewash. The, um, the truth is even worse than that. The truth is that any investigation run by Elections Canada has a 90% chance of failing for reasons of the statute under which they operate. In the commissioner's report, he, he observes that 27% of the complainants that they investigated received fraudulent calls. They received calls misdirecting them to an, to an incorrect polling station. And yet he just dismisses that evidence that he himself puts forward. They have no powers of subpoena. So that means if I want to interview you for a potential violation of uh, the Elections Act, I first of all have to get your permission. And you're, you have to volunteer to do the interview. Now imagine how far the police would get, or anyone would get in a, a criminal investigation, if the person who was being investigated was the one who decided that the investigation happened. In 27% of the cases, he could prove it. He had the information that they received calls. And he just dismisses that as being non-consequential. So first of all, the legislation ludicrously flawed. And perhaps some clever operative in the Conservative Party had seen that and realized there's no way they can get us if we go this route of robocalling. All we can say is, look, we're not talking to you. And several people didn't. But every Canadian should be very concerned that a massive attempt at election fraud occurred in 2011 that was on a, an industrial scale. No one person could have coordinated these fake spoofed calls to thousands of voters in dozens of ridings. And the only way to do that was to have access to the names of likely voters whom you wanted to mislead. And Mr. Justice Mosley also said that the likely source of those lists was the Conservative Party database. So in terms of the circumstantial evidence, it all points in one direction. With this uh, party, um, the idea of getting to the finish line um, by almost any means is a dominant mode of thinking amongst a good number of, of their strategists. They used tactics that uh, went from the ones that uh, were completely against the traditions of this country to the almost criminal in some cases to those cases where people ended up getting charged and guilty uh, pleas were entered. And so at some level, whatever they're trying to do only needs to be good enough for the next election, then they'll weather the storm. In anticipation of the 42nd general election, the Harper government tabled Bill C-23, better known as the Fair Elections Act. As an American coming up to Canada, um, there's very little about Canadian politics that shocks me because uh, I've seen it in the U.S., right? Sometimes I feel like uh, I'm a character from a, a dystopic sci-fi novel coming in from the future and warning people, don't go there, I've seen how bad it is, um, because a lot of things that happen in the U.S., bad things, make their way across the border and, and seep into here. Um, so usually I've seen it before, but frankly, um, Bill C-23, the Fair Elections Act, um, shocked even me. So my response to the Fair Elections Act is complete outrage. 
the genesis of the act was in fact the robocalls cases we're talking about here. And we need an act that would do that to prevent it from happening again. And so you now leap forward and the Fair Elections Act that we got from the Conservative Party had nothing whatsoever to do with the robocalls cases. To the leader of the official opposition, Thomas Mulcair, it went beyond politics. And we said, we've got to fight this thing tooth and nail. So for example, we shut down all participation because it requires unanimous consent, all participation in trips by parliamentary committees. We used whatever tools we had as the official opposition to send a very strong signal to the Conservative government. At first reading, the Minister of State, Poliev, argued the bill's provisions were necessary to eradicate systemic voter fraud, the illegal practice of a voter casting more than one ballot. We know from study after study after study that there is there's no significant voter fraud in the United States or in Canada, uh, and yet it enables certain politicians to come forward with legislation saying they're trying to prevent voter fraud, when clearly what they're trying to do is disenfranchise uh, portions of the population, and young people are high up on that list. Plyleev got it exactly wrong. Number one, there's no evidence that any of this has ever happened, that voters are trying to vote more than once. And Stephen Harper has a clever line. He said it a few times in the House. Canadians want to make sure there are secret votes, not secret voters. And the goal is crystal clear. There are some people they don't want to have vote. Disproportionately, youth, First Nations, and, and, and impoverished Canadians. And those people are the ones that they've identified who are not likely to vote Conservative. They had the crazy idea, and they used the expression, the Conservatives said it was a, a conflict of interest for Elections Canada to be doing advertising to encourage people to vote. What an absurd idea. People in charge of your elections should be encouraging people to vote and using whatever tools they have. And we should be providing them with more tools, not fewer. They have their greatest leverage at the polls when fewer people vote. The Harper government sought to end the nation's time-honored practice of vouching. Vouching allows a person of legal voting age, but without proof of identity, to vote if advocated by another voter with required identification. So the more, the more I followed this and the more I got into it, the, uh, the, and the more concerned I became. Brent Rathgeber, at the time MP from the Alberta riding of Edmonton St. Albert, had resigned from the Conservative Party caucus and sat as an independent became schooled that it was very important to, to many groups who, for whatever reason, may not have a uh, requisite ID to prove where they live. But getting rid of vouching when you already made it so complicated for people was, I could see, a way of reducing voter turnout. The blunder that the Conservatives made was uh, on trying to make it so onerous to try and actually go and vote that everyone could understand that. People were coming in and saying, this doesn't work, you, you, you can't do this. You're making it more difficult for a lot of people to vote. It's the opposite that you should be doing. The country's most respected legal minds and academics submitted petitions citing the Fair Elections Act in breach of the nation's charter of rights and freedoms. And all of a sudden, everyone looked at the act and all sorts of other things came out. There were about a dozen of them, of them in total that made elections more unfair and they paid a political price for it. It was unanimous against this bill. Everyone started to prove that this was about the Conservatives cheating. The Fair Elections Act was just yet another example of the Conservatives doing very similar things to what uh, George W. Bush, Dick Cheney, and Karl Rove did in the United States in terms of making technical changes that are buried in huge bills, difficult to understand, as, but all aimed at undermining accountability and furthering the interests of the ruling party. The bill was universally censured as an American Republican adaptation of legalized voter suppression. What we need is real change. Then-Liberal leader Justin Trudeau impugned the conservative record of electoral fraud 
and condemned the Fair Elections Act. Conservatives have been found guilty of breaking election laws in every election since 2006. In each of the elections, 2006, within and out, 2008 with various individual players like Dean Del Mastro cheating on their expenses, uh, 2011, we had robocalls. So I'm proposing we make every vote count. Therein, the 23rd Prime Minister-to-be made his signature campaign promise. We are committed to ensuring that the 2015 election will be the last federal election using first past the post. The promise of electoral reform is as old as Confederation itself. The nation's first Prime Minister, John A. Macdonald, believed proportional representation would result in a just and democratic outcome. You can get a party with 35 or 40 percent of the vote that has carte blanche to do as it wishes over a four-year period, and it can't be defeated in Parliament. Yet, generations of Canadians hold close the belief their parliamentary democracy is the envy of the world. When in truth, the country's first past the post system has fallen behind the times in its democratic ideals. The East European countries, after communism fell and they were trying to adopt parliamentary systems, who did they copy? Did they copy Canada or the United States or Great Britain? No, they did not. They copied all the continental European models, which was proportional representation. If you get 30% of the vote, you get 30% of the seats and so on. So I think when, when they were coming out of communism and looking for good examples, they did not look to us. They did not look to a country like Canada. There's only three countries in the world left that call themselves democracies that don't have some form of representational democracy. One of them is Canada, the other is the United States, and the third one is the UK. The question also raised, is the first past the post predisposed to voter suppression schemes more so than other electoral systems? Every riding is important, and the vote in every riding is important. So in close seats, if you can suppress the vote, it's going to make a significant difference. You might end up winning uh, an extra dozen seats or so, and that might be enough to put you over the top. Changing our voting system is not going to get you honest or ethical or open or necessarily waste preventing government, but it will get us much more representative government. Uh, we are in danger of getting governments that represent only about a third of the population just because they managed to fluke their way in some sense into a majority government. Whereas again, if we look at, if we look at the European cases, Sweden adopted proportional representation, I believe in 1914. So they've had it for more than a century. They're a century ahead of us. We are yet to catch up to them.